Well, welcome back to a very special episode of the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast because you might hear from the planes, the birds, the mowers that's literally just started as we've started recording the podcast. We're outside. It's myself, Rick Shields, here with producer Guy, and we do have a guest on the podcast as well today, which we'll introduce you to shortly. What's it like to be outside doing a podcast, Guy? It is very weird, and I'm glad this is being filmed because you look weird with your hand wrapped around that microphone in your jacket, all cold. It's like it's sunny, and it feels like when you're in the car, you look outside, and it's like, wow, it's a lovely day. You get out here, and it's actually really cold, but I'm glad to be back. Last week, you held the fort on your own, Rick. Thanks. How do you think it went? Uh, <laughs> well, when I filmed it, or what, sorry, when I recorded it, and you listened to it, right? Yes times two to get through it in 15 minutes <laughs> it was 11 30 at night the world was kind of just going crazy as it still is right now and i was lying on the sofa and just thinking i'm just gonna i'm just gonna wing this for maybe 15 mm-hmm. 20 minutes 50 minutes went by and i was yeah. thinking how did that happen yeah the story that i picked was way too long yeah, it was the sam salmon who the lad it was josh and or whatever hit by a car and all that car, stuff. i'm sure that was made <laughs> up but just off the cuff they actually sent a nightmare story um so we like I say we thought we'd get back to normal uh, regime to some de- description we're out on the golf course today because mm-hmm. we are about to go and film uh it's friday afternoon we wanted to do the podcast even though the golf a world at the moment has come to some level of a standstill, certainly from a tournament standpoint. Yeah, We're still out here making videos. We're still doing our bit. We're still social, self-isolating each other yeah. as much as we can. In, in a way, as it stands, there's never been a better time to get on the golf course because the sun's out. It's a bit cold, but the sun's out. The weather's got better. The weather's got better. People are working from home and can sneak a few holes if they want to. And so far... Like the Marriott words where we are now, we were here yesterday, it's been really good. Everyone's been sensible. Yeah, and, that, and that's the big thing. You know, I've played a couple of golf courses um, this week and people have been sensible on the golf course. Things like ball cleaners have been covered. The pins have been... I played at Centurion mm-hmm. this week in the second-hand, club, uh, second-hand golf bit of challenge with Pete, the finale, uh, which you weren't there for, but you missed a good match. And that'll be coming out. We, we'll... Originally, we were going to go the week after the Masters, but now there's no Masters. We might go week of the Masters. There's a lot of comments about it being the last one. A lot of people are gutted. And I hope it lives up to the expectations. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, let me explain why it's the last one. First off, five years we've been doing it. Me and Pete started five years doing the second-hand club bit of... <laughs> you think after five years I get the name right. Second-hand golf bit of challenge where, if you don't know the format, we go to Golf Bidder, which is a fantastic uh, site where it sells second-hand golf clubs but also um, buys used golf clubs off people as well around the Europe mainly. Uh, we get a £500 budget to spend and we go and we spend our budget on golf clubs that we think are going to suit us. We go out on the golf course and battle it out. So far, we've had four matches. So far, I've won two. So all- Pete's won two. So this effectively is a decider. Now, just to be clear, doesn't mean that me and Pete aren't going to do videos in the future. Doesn't mean we're not going to do golf bit of videos in the future. But we felt like sometimes you've got to end it on a high. And the golf bit of challenge is on a high. And a bit like Faulty Towers, I think that went out on a high. And Friends. The Office is my one. The Office. The Office is class. And Gavin and Stacey. Yeah. We decided to go out on a high um, for this format how formats might change in the future who knows but it was a good challenge we played at centurion they did something very novel with the flags where they put the uh, the cup i've seen it a few places now they could put the cup upside down actually you might get some wind noise in this podcast but i kind of quite like it it's quite authentic yeah, it is um it's freezing but it's authentic and they turn the cup upside down put the flag in so the ball when it goes into the hole you don't have to take the flag out in fact you're not allowed to take the flag out and you could actually pick your golf ball out without putting your hand in the hole to stop any kind of uh you know cross contamination or possible uh spreading of the of the c word which we're not going to mention in today's podcast um and also, you don't rake bunkers. You didn't rake a bunker out there. The green keepers would do that. With you don't on. go in bunkers anyway, though, do you? So that really well, matter. what was annoying, and you might see this in the video, that I I got told that you don't rake the bunkers. We got out, we got in after, and we got told all the bunkers were GUR. Ah. And that plays a pivotal, a pivotal 
role in the match. I won't ah, give any much spoilers. too away. Um, so, no, it's good. Loads of videos coming your way. Uh, we feel, we've actually been on a mammoth filming session this week. We managed to film three videos Monday. I did the Golf Bidder video with Pete, where he filmed in the Golf Bidder HQ. We did front nine on my channel, back nine on his channel, again, coming in April. And then yesterday, we filmed three new videos. Today, we plan to vi film a video with our guest, which we will come on to in a moment. Mm -hmm. And then next week, if the weather stays good and we're not fully on lockdown... My golly gosh, are we going to have batteries charged and ready to go? <laughs> Did you just say my golly gosh? Yeah, exactly. I'm going to get some t-shirts <laughs> made with that. Um, just if you are watching the YouTube channel at the moment, think quantity <laughs> over quality. Yeah. Is that the best way we're going at the moment? Well, yeah. Um, we're trying to get videos filmed, edited and out there. So if the normally our content's a 9 out of 10, isn't it? Some would say higher, <laughs> but yeah, we'd like to think nine out if of ten. If it's the odd six, it's all right. Relax, it's fine. We're going to try and aim for like three videos a week. So I'd take three sixes over one nine. Okay, well, that's what we're <laughs> aiming for at the moment. So the standard of the quality of the videos, not from an editing standpoint, because our editors do a phenomenal job, um, and not from the ideas, but just from time management, mm -hmm. think about it. We're trying to do bulk rather than quality at the moment. And we're going to try and keep you entertained while there's no golf on TV and there's no golf on the internet. Already I'm seeing social media channels kind of drying up of content, which is a real shame. So hopefully we can be the release. We're not going to talk about the C word. You're going to sit back, enjoy some videos and enjoy some six out of 10 quality videos. Yeah, I mean, that's our promise. I would like to watch Tiger walking down the stretch at the Masters, but if we can find a tee that hits it three yards longer, that's fine, isn't it? That's still good good content. <laughs> that makes for a video. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Already I'm like, go in, let's write that idea yeah. down. Let's make sure we don't <laughs> miss that idea. Uh, hopefully everybody out there is doing okay. It's tough times. I mean, it's bloody crazy. The world's gone, you know, it has gone mad. But hopefully you're listening to the advice from the government, doing what is necessary. Um Let's say we're doing what we can. We Even when we come to the golf course today, we're not going inside. We're, we're limiting how many people we can... Uh, you know contact with uh, golf course is one of the best places to be again if you're sensible and not shaking hands and doing the old elbow bump or the foot bump or whatever it may be and if you're out going playing golf you know give give each other gimmies um be a bit more generous out there at the moment i think that's good advice yeah i think it is good advice <laughs> <laughs> maybe i should just do the the daily updates from the government yeah that would be good imagine that on my channel hi guys welcome to rick shields youtube channel today golly gosh it's a good day <laughs> <laughs> today it's a good day no but seriously i hope everything's okay with everyone uh, rest assured we will get through this and like I say hopefully times are hard at the moment but get through it enjoy some golf content enjoy some golf if you can the sun's coming out it's getting nicer weather let's try and get through mm. the next 12 weeks six months whatever it is and come out of it on the other side hopefully being better golfers because we can practice our putting in indoor speaking of better golfers <laughs> that actually makes sense. I thought I had a really cool like segue to this next section. You're going to come on to Peter Finch then? <laughs> no. I was going to say, speaking of better golfers, and then I was going to say about bad golfers, and that was going to link to John Robbins, who was our first ever guest on the podcast. Just to inform you, Rick, and everyone listening, obviously I wasn't here last week, so a few people asked, not many admittedly, but a few people asked on the Facebook group. <laughs> Literally nobody. Um, am I still running? You're like one of those memes. Yeah. <laughs> nobody. Have you been running? Yeah. <laughs> a few people asked if I've been running. I am still running. Um... Am I still listening to John Robbins and obsessed with John Robbins? Yes, I am at the minute. We've actually um, been texting again, Rick, me and John. Um, and potentially, if everything <laughs> stays, excited you are if everything stays as it is, we should have some other monster videos come with John. But John was our first podcast guest, and he was very good. But today, we've got our second podcast guest, who I'm sure is going to be equally, if not better, than John Robbins. We have. Well, it's quite exciting because this guest um, is going to help me play better golf today and this golfer was at this per, our guest today was actually mentioned on the john robbins podcast mm. because i thought it'd be a good little segue uh, let's turn his microphone on uh which number were you again oh you're already on all that time steve you were on well i just kept quiet mate i've listened <laughs> to you uh, to you you two you're doing a great job thank you so steve from tour caddy experiences you are a tour caddy and am I right in saying for how many years have you been going for? 15 full seasons. Wow. On the European Tour, yeah. And that's, uh, that's been caddying for... Give us, a, give us a list, give us a rundown who you caddied for. Okay, so I started with Steve Webster, yep. um, who I grew, grew up with, uh, childhood golf, played together, um, and ended up having to caddy for him. 
um, Paul Broadhurst, who's um, who's now doing very very well on the uh, the seniors tour. Mm-hmm. Um, he had quite a bit of a spell. He lost his card at the age of 44, and then uh, and then had to wait f- till 50 to get on the senior tour. Um, and he was travelling the country, just playing in prams to keep his golf um, good, if you like. And then first European Tour seniors event, he goes out and wins in Scotland. So uh, quite an amazing story for Brody there. Um, Anthony Wall was my next uh, k- player, and then I was with David Howell for six seasons. So nice. uh, yeah, Howell was one one of my longest running. Um, then I had Mark Warren for about eight months, uh, Richie Ramsey for just over a year, and now I'm with uh, a local lad to here, actually, David Horsey. Oh, yeah, Dave. Yeah. So, question. Yeah. You uh, mentioned that they're, they are players. Is that how you see it? Or are boss. They, are boss, they your boss? Say. Yeah, they're my boss. Yeah. Has any of them requested you call them boss? No. <laughs> That's what you yeah. use to me all the time, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I only get to call Rick Rick on the podcast. Yeah, it's always I mean, boss. I mean, joking, sometimes we do call them boss. But um, no, we we look up to them as, as our boss because they pay our wages. Um, but they're our player and we're part of a team at the end of the day. Yeah. I, you see that a lot more these days. I feel like players like Jordan Spieth and yep. Justin Thomas really kind of captivated that we. Yeah. They engage. To they I. engage together well. Um I think, uh, I think if you spoke to a player, um, it's more them. Um, if you speak to a caddy, it's more us. Um, uh, but we, you know, we don't seem. To, I don't. I don't think the caddies get enough recognition, especially the top caddies in the world. You know, they do a, an unbelievable job. And you know, we can. We had just uh, just in time. I say the um, the other day that um, you know I should listen to you more uh, on one of the shots in America. You know, and that to me is is in you know saying that you know like, that's what I pay you for kind of thing so um, so yeah I don't think the caddies do get enough recognition well I want to dive into a few things because I, I am intrigued about the role of a caddy yeah. and we are going to go out today and you are going to caddy for me I am yeah um, I've never had a proper professional caddy caddy for me I like that and keep, you sh- can keep calling me a I'm, proper caddy and I'm <laughs> sure you've never caddied for less than a proper actual player oh no 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 I have I, I shot have. four over here recently you know yeah you're going to beat that today <laughs> yeah so normally it's like right we're at the European tour we want to make the court we want to come top 20 top yeah. 10 today yeah. if you can beat two over gross around the Marriott Worsley on forward tees you're, done my job. you've done your job <laughs> you've you earned your cross you get paid today well I hope so <laughs> but of, not only that you want to you want to talk about tour caddy experience sure, which yeah. we'll definitely come on to because yeah. I think it's a wonderful service that I've only ever heard great things about thank you but what, what's crazy and we'll, we'll go through a few things first so to put a bit in perspective, the first time I ever met you, this is not the first time I ever met you no. the first time I ever met you we were we were sipping free booze in our swimming shorts around a pool in the sunshine in Tenerife. We was. Um, what was qu- quite amazing, I'd saw you out on tour playing in prams before, um, but never never had sort of bumped in you to say hello. And then um, I was sitting, it was Tenerife in December, sitting by the pool and, uh, no, it was at breakfast actually, the first time I saw you. And I thought, that's Rick Shields, got to be. It can't be a spitting image of Rick Shields. Was, it, was one, it the Nike, the Nike hat, the it beard? Was, yeah, the Nike hat. The, <laughs> the camera that was following me. The, your golf glove on, your, your, your shoes. Um, <laughs> that was just at breakfast. So, uh, <laughs> um, But yeah, then I um, I sort of texted a, uh, a mutual friend. Well, you texted Rob Potter, didn't I you? I did, yeah. I texted Rob Potter and said, uh, do you know if Rick Shields is on holiday this week? And about 10 minutes later, he said, yeah, he's in Tenerife. I says, not going to believe this. It was uh, such a small world. Well, Rob was like an excited puppy. He texted me going, Rick, Rick, you won't believe this. But <laughs> but Steve, you know the guy who did my tour caddy experience? He's at the hotel. You need to bump into him. You need to get chatting to him. And anyway, you know, it wasn't that long and we did actually bump into each other. We ended up watching the Anthony Joshua fight, yeah, and which was uh, a, a bit of a letdown. To it be was. fair, we, we spoke mostly about golf and caddy and everything yeah, else. Did, yeah. But um, no, it's great. And then obviously at the moment, and I, again, I don't want to touch on it too much, but it's a it's a time for you where you know you need to keep busy because Absolutely, yeah. professional golf is no yeah, longer being played at, at the moment it's scary times really for us um i mean even even when we're out on the circuit full time you know we we don't get paid for 20 odd weeks a year we only get paid when we're working so you know we we probably do about 30 events over the course of a year so the other 22 weeks we we're not getting paid so we rely on our player to be doing well and um, to get a percentage of his uh, his, his cut, um, but now we there's tournaments being cancelled left, right, and centre, and we 
we've no idea when we're when we're going to go back out on tour again um and that's that's pretty scary for you know for someone that relies on you know and I, i've spoke to a couple of caddies over the last week or so and some of them are going to work for amazon some are taxi driving you know they've got to do stuff to um you know to, to keep busy and to earn some money and pay the bills really and many are many caddies are all caddies on that similar format where you only really get paid when you caddy are any are any of the big are yeah, the big guys I mean, on salary yeah, or the, the top the top boys are going to be on a retainer yeah um but whether they'll be getting paid now or there's no tournaments on i, I, I that could change i don't know you'd but feel like the best players in the world certainly you know mm. your, your tigers your yeah yeah your, your I think brooks kepka those guys yeah. I they've got enough be, I don't think they'll be uh, ringing their caddies up and saying, oh, by the way, I'm not going to pay you for the next three months because we're not playing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and t- t- do you know what? The, the top 50 caddies in the world probably are, are sort of enjoying the break because um, because they do make a really good living out of it. They um, they make plenty of money, and, and this is a bit of family time and a bit of downtime for them guys. But the, the caddies at the, the bottom end of the scale, um, you know, they, they need to keep working and, and make some cash. Well, it's the caddies, the players that are outside that, what 100 150th yeah, in the I world think, i think if you're not making race to dubai every year so top 60 top 50 60 of the order of merit um so anything from 60th to to 110 um you know you, you you're gonna have to do something in these in this you know who knows we could be we, the, the tour could get cancelled you know who knows i mean there's the czech republic in august has been cancelled already it's crazy. Oh, crazy. You know, there's nice. talks that the Ryder Cup might not play this year. I know. They're talking about putting it back a year, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, it is. It's, if, it's if mad. It's that, if it's that, I mean, and what you've got to remember is you can't just play 10 events, 12 events on the European Tour for a season because the lads that have gone to tour school last year, kept the card through Challenge Tour, um, lads that are going fighting for world rankings, it's just that, you know, they can't, you're going to have to either cancel the tour and then start again in 2021. Or if they don't, and you only give yourself 12, 15 events to keep your card, it's a bit unfair, really. It's a, it's a difficult one for it's the tour. The tour has is. got a really... They've got, they've got a big head, headache on their hands. Keith Belly, you know, I'll take my hat off to him. He's, uh, he's got a, a tough job ahead, for sure. And do you get good communication from those guys, or do you get it fed through yeah, from I mean, your players? We, well, is, there a, is there a caddy association? Yeah, we've got a caddy association, um, and they do a brilliant job. You know, they're from looking after our hotels to uh, social media side of things and everything. It, they do a really good job. And there's probably seven or eight caddies that um, run the association. Um, and we get up to date with emails and WhatsApps and telegrams uh, as and when it happens, really. Well, hopefully you can get back up on your feet soon. But it, like I say, in the meantime, you've a couple of things. And one, one of the reasons why you're here today and we spoke about it in Tenerife is that you've set up a, a company at the moment that is really you know it has the potential of striving in this, yeah, in this well that's, time that's a plan and for a thick caddy i can't believe it's me that's done it really um but it, it, again it was it was back the end of 2017 um i was caddying for howler um he was injured i've got three months of sitting on my ass doing nothing and i'm thinking well, you know i need to i need to be earning some money on these this time off um what can i do and well what do i do i caddy um so my local golf club at newark golf club in nottinghamshire i Put a, ask, the, ask the committee if they minded me um, putting a notice up to do a course management lesson because I know the pro didn't do that. I, I obviously I spoke to him first and he was absolutely fine with me doing it. And off the back of it, I was uh, giving him some sort of gapping sessions on Trackman, um, and I I did that for probably a couple of months and got inundated with messages from the members of the golf club wanting to come and do it. So all of a sudden, I thought, well, if my members want to do this, then surely. UK might want to do it, the you know the world of golf if you like. So, I um, I spoke to about twenty caddies all over different places in the UK and see if they'd be interested in doing it. And they all said, yeah, what a great idea. Um, so I googled how to set up a, a website. Went onto something called Squarespace at the time. Um, set up the website, got all the caddies on board, social media it, and here we are now. We've got fifty caddies all over the world uh, working for us. So it's uh, and basically what it is is. It's not us caddying for pros. It's us, like you just said, oh, you've probably never caddied for someone like me, but I've caddied from Bob from Swindon off 22, you know, he's, and, and that's, that, well, that's what we do. We get them round. We're not pro golfers, so we don't teach the swing. You know, we, we don't do what you do and, and give golf lessons. What we do is we get them um, down, down the first hole in less shots as possible, A to B to C, use your shots, take the stress out of it, and shot selection. I mean, a lot of the golfers don't know how far they hit the ball. I send a Google form out every time we do one 
how far do you hit the ball? And 90% of the amateurs will say eight iron, 150. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, Nowhere that, near. I know. Well, the, I th- am I right in saying, you probably know this more than me, the amateur, let's say a 19 handicapper, the average distance for a seven iron is 138 yards. Yes, yeah, I can see that. And that's just a, that's a good hit. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Av- that's not. I wouldn't say that's average. No. I have students come into the to the golf academy and I'll get them on GC quad at 67 iron again how far do you hit it or just over 150 yeah, yep. and they don't hit it 135 and it's like is your machine's wrong I'm like no it's yeah, not it's the, just the thing you is I kind of get it in, in a some regard because if you're a 20 handicapper let's just say and the third hole at your course is a par 3 and it's 150 yep. and you play it on a nice hot sunny day wind behind and you hit your 8 iron it gets in the green Certainly. in your mind and rightly so that shot has got a 150 with an 8 iron so you then think oh that's how far I hit my iron yeah. which obviously we know there's, and we say this a lot there's so many more factors when you're out on the golf course the wind the, uh, the air etc etc but question I had for you and it's quite a, a vague one so I don't know how you could answer this but I want to see Go. what you say Go if you have an 18 handicapper yep. and you give them the talk and experience and you know, a good round for them is eighteen over. What would you typically? How many shots reduced would you typically see? And it's um, hard to answer, admittedly. But well, it's not really because uh, there was a guy at my golf club when I first started called Lou Hutchinson, and when he first came to see me, he was off nineteen. Mm-hmm. But I could tell watching him on the range that this lad hits the ball a lot, lot better than nineteen. So for me, it was why on earth are you not getting your handicap down? So we took him. So I took him round, round, uh, round Newark for 18 holes. And I stand on the first tee at Newark, out of bounds left, trees down the right, um, it's 450 yards, it's index four. And all he was thinking about then was, I've got to hit driver because I've got to get on the green in two. Now, you're a 19 handicapper. There's yeah. a reason why you're 19. So, he, he, so what I do is I get my golf ball and his golf ball, and I say, right, you play the hole the way you want to play it, and you use my ball doing what I tell you to do. So we stood on the first tee, he carves his driver way right into the trees, um, takes my ball, and I give him a five iron, which he hits 180 yards. He's a big, stocky lad, so he, he don't need the length. So five iron straight down the middle. So we, we give him a target to aim at, five iron on the fairway. Now the hole's 450 yards, so we get up there to my ball first, and I said, right, another five iron, another 180 yards, 360, should leave you about 100 yards to the green. Sure enough, picks his target, it's five iron on the fairway. We get to his ball, it's stymied behind the tree, so we've had to chip it out onto the ninth fairway, which we did. Then I tried to get him to it to wedge over the trees because there's no other way to get back to mm-hmm. the hole. Thins it into the trees again, chips it out, gets on the fairway for four, and he's still going in with five iron for his th- uh, for his fifth shot. Misses the green, gets gets to my ball, chips it onto from 81 yards, I think it was, if I remember rightly, because this is this is my story of uh, yeah, yeah. getting him to a good golfer. Um, and he, he hits it to eight feet, misses the putt, but taps it in for a, the most stress-free five net four, and he was still going with eight shots with his ball so we picked it up so we'd sort of got him right okay well I'd never would have thought of doing that before but that was a tough hole that you needed to respect um, where before in his mindset he was thinking I've got to get on the green in two where for me use your shot get on the green in in three give yourself a chance for a net birdie but if at worst you're going to make five yeah keep so, those mistakes to a minimum absolutely so pretty much all the way around we kept his driver in the bag and the most he hit off the tee was a three wood that was two years ago. He's now six handicap. Wow. And that is my success story, if you like, yeah. from, from Luke. He's, uh, and he, we, have a, we have a fiddle most Saturday mornings and anything between 30 and 60 of us every Saturday morning, chuck the balls in. And just, Luke, just explain to anybody who doesn't know what a fiddle means and fiddle, chucking your golf <laughs> <Yes>. ball. <laughs> just explain Sorry. that a bit more. Sorry, a fiddle is like a chuck up. So group of lads, 30 lads to 60 lads, uh, turn up every Saturday morning at Newark. Um, we chuck the balls in a hat. Draw four out. <laughs> it's a bit more PC. Golf balls, golf balls in a hat. Um, <laughs> we draw the four out, and you go off with uh, with four lads. It's single Stableford, five pound in the kitty. Uh, the winner buys the first round, and and Luke still comes in now with thirty eight, forty points. Love it. Most I bet you must be proud about that. As I well. am. Yeah, that's that's my story. That's what I tell him. It's, oh. all, it's like you know, I see it from probably a slightly more. Um, isolated position in the fact that when I coach a student they hit it better yep. and I might hear the story six months down the line or two or three months down the line wow my handicap's dropped by five or something yep. where the course management lesson you're almost seeing it instantly the, the good thing for yeah. me well what I hear a lot from the amateurs is god I've hit the ball great today but shot four over my handicap you know and that's where we come in that's what we do now you guys get them striping it brilliant it's easy for us then to get them around the golf course in as low shots as possible um, and I think between us, you know, we we could we could get the you know the handicap golfer down. I mean, Rob Protter, like, like you said, he's uh, 
he's like a, a wind up monkey if you like he's he's so excited about everything um and he was telling me that his lowest round of golf was uh was 76 now he came around knew it with me played my golf ball the way i told him to play it and fair play to him he stuck to the game plan and, and stuck with it went around his 78 and he'd never played the golf course before and he was like oh my god i just shot i broke 80 where because he came to me and he said oh, i must get down to single figures I, I, he's got this thing about i've got to get down to single figures i said rob you haven't played to 10 for 18 months i said how about we try and get you playing to your handicap first and then then we'll get your handicap down it, it, it's because i've told him we don't need a mid handicap tester anymore i need, <laughs> I need a single figure yeah. handicap tester yeah, that's it <laughs> but rob's a funny one he probably won't he, play he, any more competitions now yeah some people and I, I as a junior i was um the kind of person that was not very good at ball striking but played a lot of golf so just understood how to kind of get it round but i feel like somebody like Rob is so obsessive with striking the ball and hitting 100 balls a day at yeah. the golf range. When he gets into the golf course, it's almost like he doesn't know what to do no. sometimes. I, I almost told Rob one time, you know, I love Rob to bits, but he, he turn up with two measuring devices, <laughs> one on his wrist, one on his bag, and laser, his club's pristine, everything's gapped and measured. He gets there two hours early, hits balls, prepares, then goes out and has a nightmare. And mm. I almost just go without any GPS yeah. Yeah. Go hungover. Yeah. Go have a have yeah. a big night out it's the night serious. before. Turn up five minutes before you tee off, and I reckon you'll play better golf. Absolutely. Yeah. And that sometimes it is. It's finding what works for a player, though. It's, I'm not saying that works for everybody, oh, no, but no. it is working for what players. Here's an interesting question: For an average golfer, let's say let's say a, a, an 18 handicap, right? And now you'll you'd accounted for quite a few of them now with this. Yeah. What patterns have you have you spotted? That is, a, is general advice for an 18 handicapper watching now. How could they take on board what you've maybe learned and improve their game? Okay, so the, fir the first thing I would say is if going back to the pars of, of each hole, so par three, par four, par five, if you're if obviously an 18 handicapper has got a shot on every hole. So for me, on a par three, get on in two, on a par four, get on in three, and on a par four, on a par five, you get on in four. If you can work your way on how you're going to do that, not by pulling the driver every time and not by hitting three wood to try and get it as close as you can to the green. But, you know, what's your favourite club in the bag? Because that's a question I ask on the on the form that I send out as well. What, what's your go-to club? Like I asked you the other night, what, what's your go-to club? Now, a lot of the 18 handicappers will say, oh, I've got a lovely little 18-degree rescue club that I hit 170 mm -hmm. yards, you know. So, you know, when it comes to a par five and it's 500 yards, they could hit three good rescues and still get on the green in three if, you know or it's there or thereabouts where i find that they'll pull a driver they'll pull a three wood they mess it up and before you know it they're getting on the green in six or seven and that's what's bringing a bad score into play so for me it's it's all about you know finding out what club you like the most what what you're most confident with especially with when it comes to around the greens as well you know they always think oh i've got to get it up to the green now if you're a 30 40 yard pitch and the flag's at the front so difficult to get it close where if you're good with your pitching wedge from your pitching wedge goes 100 yards and you're, you're pretty confident in a full shot 100 yards, why not lay it up to 100 yards? Because you've got more, especially at a front flag, you've got more chance of getting it close than trying to chip and run or, or you know, what a lot of them do is pull a lob wedge out mm. and think they're going to strike it onto the green every time. And nine times out of ten, it's a thin or a duff. You know, so it's, 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 it's sh shot selection more for me, getting them to play the right shot, um, Will will help their get their handicap down definitely. How do you find it then when you play in a roll up on a Saturday with your mates? If you have a bad round and uh, you go in the trees, which is which is every, every how do, do they start almost looking at you saying you should be listening to yourself? I or say do as I say, not do as I do. I like that. <laughs> what, do you, what do you play off, Steve? Plus three. Oh wow. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. we got? I don't know what I thought you were going to say. I don't know no, why. I thought I, you were going to say I, about four for some I reason. I expected single figures. Yeah. But I didn't yeah. expect plus three. Yeah, God, plus three. Hell. So, so did you ever, you know, yeah, was, so was the goal I, to I play? dabbled. Well, hey, as a young kid, I was going to be the next Tiger Woods, um, like all young kids. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I lived in Warwickshire. Um, I, I got down to scratch at the age of 15, and I thought I was a big fish yeah. Uh, you know, I was going to be the next best thing. And there used to be, we used to play in all the Warwickshire events and there were three lads at the time. Um, there was a, a lad called Sam Walker, who, who's now caddying, but used to be a player. Um, Tom Whitehouse, who's working for the Rob Rock Academy. Um, and Jim Phillips. And then there was me. And we used to roll up and the sort of, the, the conversations you heard in the back going, oh, do you think, who do you think is going to win today? Is it going to be Steve? Is it going to be Tom? Is it going to be Sam? And we'd always have a really good battle between us. And, um, and I ended up being a caddy. Tom ended up being a coach. Sam's now a caddy. Um, 
and I don't know what Jim's doing. So, uh, so obviously we all had that dream and thought we was going to be big time. But you know, I, t- I turned pro. I went on the Euro Pro. Uh, I had three years doing that, and it was at the time then Lee Slattery was playing. Um, Phil Kenyon, who's now the putting coach, uh, I roomed with Michael Welsh for for three years, and Welsh he was one of the best amateur golfers growing up. Um, you know, out there and. Uh, and even he didn't make it as a pro. He's now coaching. Um, so, as good as we thought we were, we just it was a, just a massive eye opener when we turned pro and we were playing against the the guys coming from all over the country to and even the world sometimes to play these Euro Pro events. They were so good. So for you, someone like you then that was plus three and or, you know scratch at fifteen or whatever, yep. obviously that is really good golf. Mm. But what is the main difference between somebody that like yourself that then gets that level and doesn't? go further than the Steve Webster it's consistent it's consistency you know uh, these lads are doing it week in week out four days a week and they're they're shooting consistently under par now I could go out and shoot six under but then I could shoot 80 the next day you know it's that that was the difference for me and I think and and I'm not saying I met I would have ever ever made it as a as a European tour or a challenge tour player but I think if I'd had the experience that I've got now as as a caddy and I and I was a young 18 year old kid trying to make it as a pro I probably would have done a lot, lot better because my mental state as a young kid was horrific. I was, uh, you know, we see Tyrrell Atten when he has a, a little bit of a meltdown. Now, I can I can relate to that in a way because you need to relieve a bit of steam. If you're that kind of person, you've that's in your, you know, that's your nature, then I, I can see it. But for me, I would, lo- I would lose it and then that would carry on for six holes and that's my tournament over. Yeah. Tyrrell loses it but then carries on. He almost plays better exactly yeah. after he loses it, which yeah. is it's very people don't understand there, that. It? People don't understand that they give him they give him so many pelters on on social media about oh you're you know our kids bad are watching you and and you, yeah you're a bad example and but that's that's his way of and getting he wouldn't through. get to that level if it didn't work for him would it absolutely not. But, so when you're caddying for the, well not necessarily for your players when you're caddying with your players and they're in a three ball with two other European tour players or whatever yeah do you find yourself looking going yeah, these guys are better than I ever would have been. Or, do, well, do you ever think, though, when you see somebody think, oh, I could have done what he's doing? No. Are they always just... Yeah. Even the even the lads that struggle to keep the card every year are head and shoulders above what I was. Yeah. Head and shoulders. That's crazy, well, isn't it? It is, because yeah. we went to, um, me and Rick went to European Tour Qualifying School, la- 2018, wasn't it? And we did like a little mini documentary. <laughs> Lu- Lumina in Spain. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of the guys there, like, got through with ease. I don't want to say, you know, score-wise, with ease, yep. they got through. And we really kept an eye on them, and some of them did okay, but a lot of them like lost the card. And it just shows that those guys are like the best of the best. Yeah. But yeah, you get onto like the European tour, and well, they don't keep a card. Yeah, I mean, it's you look at so some, hard. You look at the story I was telling you about Brody earlier. He lost his card at 44, and then he turned senior pro at, at 50, and he's now 54, and he's t- he's won two major championships and made over a million dollars a year. Yeah. Now. It's because of the youth of the today, the young kids that uh, are hitting it three three twenty through the air and put okay and chip okay. You know, you, you, the Brody was hitting it two sixty two seventy. You know, you're, you're fifty sixty yards behind. You're hitting four ironing. They're hitting eight ironing. That's that's the difference of today's game. The technology and and everything and the young kids that are coming through, they hit it so so far. Yeah. Are you noticing now as well? I feel like I'm seeing it a bit more, but tour pros who are coming through the rookies are just so much further developed yeah absolutely. not only in their golf games but in the mental state yeah. and the way that they, they deal with the press how much better they are on social media absolutely are you seeing that firsthand as yeah, well yeah definitely tour? i mean i mean they, these kids are coming through and they it's like childhood golf you know when we were kids and you'd play around the putting green for a pro v1 with your mate and you got an eight footer and you bosh straight in the back of the old not a care in the world these kids are like that you know where Someone that's a journeyman um, professional now that uh, I know that they're going to struggle to keep the card every year, that eight-footer all of a sudden looks like yeah. a really small hole and, oh, I don't want to three-whack this kind of thing. These kids are just standing up and, you know, they're brave. They, they've got no care in the world. They just do it. Do you, what's changed that? Do you, think, do you think the influence of Tiger and the way he dealt with his mental state and the yeah. way he dealt with the media. He's massive. Um, he, do, do you think he set the bar? Because, like yeah. I say, these kids that are coming through now, your Victor Hovland, your Matt Wolves, you guys like that, they, they were born in the years that Tiger dominated and they're mm. kind of coming through now with such a different mindset yeah. on the game. Yeah, they're not, absolutely. Like you mentioned, they're not scared. No. Like, for those guys, I think... Um, 
Matt Wolf, Victor Hovland, um, Colin. I would struggle with the surname. Yeah, I know that. I never uh, got you. Maki, Maki, <laughs> well, I'll yeah, let you pronounce struggle, it. Struggle mm. with the surname. All one on tour. Like all one on tour. First yeah. years out. It's like crazy. Yeah. Well, like, Ro- Robbie McIntyre, first year out, uh, lefty um, on the European tour. Again, he's a big, big hitter. Stocky lad. Um, big hitter. Puts like you can't believe. No fear. He doesn't look like he's got a care in the world. He just looks like he stands up to it, sees his shot and goes with it. You know, and um, and, and that's and that's why he got Rookie of the Year last year, I suppose, because he's he was fearless. Mm. You know, and I, I think yeah, going back to the Tiger thing, Tiger's been he's been brilliant for golf, and you know, and and all these kids coming through. I, I remember when you used to come play in the park with the, with your mates playing football, and you'd you know you'd you'd score a a goal in the top corner and you'd run around saying I'm Beckham you know that's a bit like what you was when you was holding a put on the or chipping in you'd say oh it's Tiger you know mm. and, and, and that he's he's been brilliant for the sport and I'm so glad to see him back because you know a few years ago when he was in Dubai and I was on the putting green and he was walking from the putting green to the range he just looked like a broken man he was he, even Is that just when he walk- retired after the first round yeah I mean even just walking he looks in so much pain and we all said, you know, he's he's obviously body's just given up on him. He's he's struggling, but you know, to get that back and his fitness back, and then to come back and win the Masters was well, just incredible. Different level on it. Yeah, it was mad. Um, you know what? I, I always I've obviously been to a number of of European Tour events, and I've you know I've seen how obviously on the golf course, literally how close the caddy and player are. Yeah. But obviously off course, that can be quite different. Catch like Tommy and Finno were really friendly. Good I think match, he was yeah. best man at his wedding. I think, but like. Is there any that you've had, you don't have to obviously name names, where it's just literally an on course, we meet at said time and we finish and we go and we don't see each other? All of them. Is really? <laughs> um, is that no, just I to mean, keep that distance and keep it? Yeah, I think I think you've, you know, you meet two hours before, mm-hmm. you practice, you play four and a half to five hours on the, ra- on the, on the round and then you have an hour's practice after. So you're in each other's company for 89 nine hours a day. If you've had a great round, everything's ha- everything's good. If you've had a bad round, the last thing you want to do is then go out for dinner with them or yeah. go and share a room with them because, you know, you've you've got to just have your own time. Um, a lot of the, I mean, the job's changed quite a lot for me over the last few years where there's a lot of wives and girlfriends and mates and brothers coming out to caddy for these players now um, where you you probably would see them out at night having food together, which is because that's what they want. You know, they want someone to be able to, spend all day with you know but some golfers and most of the golfers out there would would just have you there as, as you're the employee you're the caddy um see you again tomorrow after the round you know um you know n- not invite you out for dinner or you know or a few drinks after yeah and that's another thing that interests me um how the fact that obviously you guys are super talented and an amazing golfer yourself you no 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 <laughs> well, well not every golf not every golf caddy is a good golfer let me tell you there's a lot of I mean, even if they, I mean, a lot of them don't play golf anymore. Well, that, yeah, that kind of leads me on to my question. The fact that you personally then, maybe I should have worded that differently, you personally are obviously a good golfer who has done this for 15, 16 years. But then equally, like, you saw Lee Westwood's wife, Caddy, and how much, and did he win with her on the bag recently? Yeah, they won in yeah. South Africa. So, like, how, I'm sure she obviously knows the stuff to be doing it with Lee, but, like, how much does that, because how does that work then when someone's, like, friend or partner comes in the bag? Is it just more because they feel comfortable with them? Yeah, I think, I mean... Going back to Rory and Harry, um, now Rory had a load of stick a couple of years ago when he took Harry on, saying that he wouldn't have done this, he wouldn't have done that if he'd got a proper caddy on the bag and, and all this and the other. For me, uh, that's just a load of rubbish because Rory obviously needed a friend. He needed someone that he could relate to, someone that he could talk to, someone he could be with off the golf course. Um, and for me, I, I salute him for that because that was what he needed as a, as a golfer. Now, whether a whether a caddy might have saved him a, a shot or two on the way round, so be it. But Rory's such a good golfer; he knows how to get around a golf course. He, yeah, I mean, you probably don't want that extra added pressure of when you're out on the golf course. You, you know, you want your caddy to do certain things so you can just, you know, have the shot and hit it. Um, but for me, having Harry on the bag is is obviously he's had brilliant years and he's back to world number one yeah. again so you know for all the haters out there I, I think they got that wrong a little bit i feel like i've got a lot of questions we've got we've got loads from social by the way mm-hmm. just really good ones as well I've just yeah. been flicking through a few but questions i i want to ask is first off how many times well, it's probably hard to say how many times is it difficult when you know the shot that the player wants to hit they want to hit something different 
how difficult has there ever been a time where you've literally gone no you need to hit this club like it a bit tin cup moment mm, where yeah. you said no you need to hit yeah, this there's there's a there's a couple of times i mean week in week out we have we think it's a different club and um you know and we have to sell it to them then so if they think it's uh, a 6 and we think it's a 7 we have to tell them why it's a, why it's a 7 so and you know at the end of the day it's a player's choice at the end of the day they they go with whatever they want to do um we can give as much advice as we like and we could try and I mean I, I remember th- at the Forest of Arden and, and I'm probably two two years into caddying for Steve Webster and um, he's on the 16th hole the dog leg over water and he's just in the rough and I never forget because my dad and his dad were about six yards behind us listening to what we were saying and um, uh, he got 89 yards to carry the the water to the front of the green and 97 yards to the flag and he hit this 50 54 degree 92 yards. So I said to him, look, you know, and we're doing all right. We're like lying fourth at a time or something with three holes to go. And we've got a chance of winning. And I said, look, just let's just chip a chip a wedge in there. You've got a bit of a backstop, six behind it, comes back to the flag. He said, no, no, I've got the, I've got this. It's a, it's a 54. And it came down to the, f- when he was pulled the 54 out of the bag, I stood right next to him and said, Webb, you can't carry the water with this club. You know, if you do, it's going to pitch on the green and spin back in. I said, but you can't carry it. It's, the numbers don't add up. I've got it. I've got it. I'm, I'm pumped. I'm going to get an extra few out of this. And I, and I even even when he was practicing, I said, Webb, you can't get over the water with this club. And he, he, he overruled it, went with it, straight in the water. So as a caddy then, you've got to be professional about it and say, right. So as we're walking up, I give him the ball. I said, right, come on, drop it. Let's make a good up and down. And then we've got a good chance on the 17th. As much birdie. as you want to say. I, but this is my question then. Yeah, how do you, do you, This sounds ridiculous because there's money on the line and obviously money that yeah. affects you. But do you feel like gutted because you've lost essentially no, grand? No, cause, or cause do you I've, feel chuffed in a way that I, you're well, like, you should I did listen everything to me? I could. I did everything I could. And, and both dads at the, after the round said, well, you couldn't do anymore. You know, he, he was adamant that he wanted to hit that club and that's where he went with it. So um, I did my job. Um, but, but, but then again, I've done that before and believe me we get things wrong as well yeah. so when we've overruled them and it's it's gone wrong then you have to hold your hands oh, up yeah. and say yeah you know I've, I've, I've messed up there have you ever found situations where you overrule a player and and then they don't commit to the shot that you've asked and, them to and, do and this is i feel like i'd be a bit like that yeah i feel like if you proper talk and i was really i'd be like yeah but i don't want to hit this club yeah, you say, on purpose i'd almost like go i'm going to show you that i shouldn't have hit this club uh, wrongly yeah yeah it depends how far I am in the tournament. I think when you first start with a play, you need to you need to have an understanding with that you know they tell you what shot they see. Now, because I could stand there and see one shot, if it's a left flag, I can see him drawing it into it. Um, he might want to hold it against the flag to to move it to the middle of the green. So you've got to you've got to be on the right wavelength to to judge which shot they're hitting. And then when we've decided on that shot selection, then we can choose the club that we're going to do. Um, when I caddied for Richie, Richie Ramsey, um, he always used to like shaping the ball. He never, he didn't like a straight shot. So whenever it was a, a left flag, it was always middle of the green and draw it. And it, whenever it was a right flag, it was middle of the green and fade it. So it was quite easy that. A caddy's responsibility. Okay. So, you, so it, tournament week. Yep. Do you travel with the golf clubs to the tournament? No. The, the player always travels to the golf club? Yes. When do you then first have contact with the golf clubs? Uh, whenever he tells us to meet him on a Tuesday morning, normally. So, so, th- so they'll keep him in the hotel room, or do they take? No, him we to have the a bag store. Club? We have a bag store on the. So if normally. So we you're you're caddying for me hypothetically. Yeah. You're yeah. caddying for me. We go and play in at the Dubai Desert Classic. Yeah. Okay. I'm flying out there with maybe my wife, my kids. Yeah. Do we fly together? Do we fly separately? No. Do we I fly first class? We fly. <laughs> we fly as cheap as possible. And does do the player look? You know, do they? Do they? They they fly business class, right? Mainly. Okay. So so I'm there you, business class. So you're, you're talking wife, your ticket three kids. grand, mine's three hundred. So and who pays for your ticket? Am me. I paying for it? So you pay me a wage. Yeah. So I get a wage each week when I work, uh, which basically covers my flight, accommodation, food, and drink. So I have to take my clubs. Yeah. I take them to the airport. I yeah. pack them. Yeah. I get them off the plane. So what you, what I'm saying is, if 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 it was our first week out in Dubai and you're living up here in Manchester and I'm in Newark. You're saying that I'd have to travel to your house, pick your clubs up, get to the airport, get them on a plane. I kind of feel like you'd almost always have my clubs. 
and then, but then actually, uh, what do you do, do when, when you're off? To, yeah, exactly. Mm, probably won't practice. You're just a diva. Yeah. I just say, look after these. You're just lazy by the sounds of it. So <laughs> then, so then we get to the venue. We get to Dubai. Yeah. Does the, the European tour put on a bag service yes. for the players? Uh, yeah. So well, there's a bag store. So we we get to Dubai. I'll meet you there at nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning. I'll take the bag, go and unpack it, sort the locker room out, get the balls and the gloves. Again, for the but week. where are you meeting me with my bag at the hotel? At the front. At the front of the no, at the uh, golf course. At the golf course. So I've come off the plane at the airport. I have to take my clubs to the hotel. Hotel and then the hotel to the golf club. Yeah. Hell. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. So then you meet me at the golf club with my golf clubs. Yeah. I've had to take them from the hotel to the golf course. You have, yeah. Then what are you doing? I don't imagine Rory <laughs> actually doing that. I imagine Rory's got someone that wheels his golf club. Rory's around. got an entourage. Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah uh, so yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. And I think that's like what you're asking there, Rick, is the fact that like we often look at, well, you won't because obviously you know, Steve, but like when you look at golfers on tour, you almost see them as just all being golfers, but there's so many levels, isn't there? You've got Absolutely, your Rory, yeah. who's got a team for everything. Yeah. Private jet and everything. Exactly. Yeah. And then you've got a guy who's just got his card, who's got a sponsor. That's all he's got yeah. for Ro- the year. Rory's, Rory's not having any plane delays like we do. Rory's yeah. getting on his <laughs> private jet and he's going off to the next tournament. We're sitting in the airport for six hours, hoping that the flight's going to take off. And in that situation, again, is it different? The players and caddies always travel together if it's private jet? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the top top players and caddies in the world, you always see pictures on Instagram and, and Facebook and stuff and Twitter that, oh, we're just, uh, we're just get using wheels up and we're just all getting on this to a glass of champagne and stuff. Um, you don't see us caddies in the in the airport with a, a pint of Heineken in the sports bar. <laughs> and and you, do you caddies all travel together? You, it's not, like a big group not necessarily. here? Necessarily. I mean, it depends. It depends how you're doing and what you can afford. Because I know I know caddies that would travel three different stops to get to a place just to save a couple hundred quid. Um, because the more money they save, the more money they keep. Yeah, exactly. So so out out of your wages each week, you want to keep your expenses to a minimum, really. So you can still make a little bit on your wages. Um, obviously, the big money is relying on them making the cut and, and having a decent finish. But um, yeah, we want we, we obviously want to try and do it as cheap as possible. But not, you know, back in the day, I know that thirty years ago there was caddies that you would would just drive all around Europe with a tent, right? Yeah. Just to save money. Just to save money. So let's say again, you're working for me, and do I pay you a set rate regardless? Only when we're working. Yeah, so we're in Dubai. Yeah, you're so, already, so you're, so definitely you're, t- get you're taking me on as a caddy. We we would discuss the wages, the percentage, the fifty percent flights if outside of Europe. Yeah. So okay, so then Tuesday you've yep. met us. Yeah. We we'll go and do some practice. Uh, is this a time where players maybe change clubs? They might have a different putter yeah, in the bag. Absolutely. You, you're working out their distances. Are you that? that well, I mean, that day? to be fair, uh, unless it's our first week, we we would know your distances by now you know but if like they put a new club in the bag or yeah they, so you know. what would it normally they have i mean you any any if you go to any tour event now you see 20 trap mans on the range every time you go down um yeah so if you put a new new club in the bag we would test it make sure the spins right the launch angles right etc cetera, etc cetera, and then ideally you know get a good number for the carry again do you have any say in any of that decision making yeah, I mean, if I don't think it's a good club for him, or, uh, you know, I'll tell him, I'll, I'll, I'll give him my opinion, obviously. Whether they take that on board or not is a different thing. So Tuesday, we've done practice. We might have a practice round. Yeah. Then what happens to my bag? So then... At the you're really getting into this thing with your bag, aren't you, yeah, Rick? So, so at the end, <laughs> at the end of... Fact. You've told me at five o'clock, right, that's <laughs> it, we're done, we've finished practicing. I'll, um, I'll take the bag to the locker. I'll get it ready for the next day, whatever we decide we're going to do, whether we're in the pram or whether we're practicing. And I'll take it to the bag store. So do you empty it with all the bottles, uh, the, any food that Bananas, we've had that day? Yeah, yeah. Put them in clean the all the clubs. Well, I suppose you clean them all the time. Clubs are you? always clean, yeah. So then Wednesday, we're playing in the Pro-Am. Yeah. Am I telling you when we're playing? Yeah. Okay. Well, no. Well, I, I would know when we're playing because the draw's out. Okay. Um, you'll tell me when we're meeting. So, so how, let's, how say, let's say it's a 10 o'clock tee off. Yeah. I would say meet at 8. Yeah. Uh, how often are players late? Oh, all the time. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine that. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if, if, if I got paid for waiting, I wouldn't be. I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> if you were a taxi driver and got paid for waiting, oh you'd be fine. my god, yeah. So we meet. Do you like proams? Yes. I mean, be- but because don't, of uh, you don't get re- paid for them, do you? No, no, we don't get paid for them. But the players what, get paid. But for what it. I do do is I I network with the amateur golfer. Okay. Obviously, with that's what why I you've do. got all your logos but on you. Yeah, that's what I do, and you know, and you never know at the end of it. Um, you know, a German guy might say, "Oh, I'm doing a golf day for BMW. Um, can you can you supply twenty caddies for us?" That's right. that's you know mm-hmm. that's brilliant. So the the players get paid for programs. They get um, there's a little bit of a prize fund. 
Okay. Um, so if they win the pro am, oh, so it actually matters. And is that just their own individual score, really. or it's uh, just uh, like it's token might, gesture? You might make a grand if you win, or something. Right. Like so it. sometimes it's like a, they do like a crystal vase or something. I've yeah. seen that in the past. Yeah. Um, okay. We're almost there. So Wednesday we've done the pro am. Thursday we're teeing off. You're, yep. you're obviously golf. looking at the start of the of the play and everything else. Yeah. Your mission there is to. It, the players, do some players go in just to make the cut, or does, uh, is always no, no. the mindset I mean, to win? You're, well, obviously everybody turns up to win. Well, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I feel like it would vary. I think if you're not going there as a player to win the golf tournament, there's no point in being there. I you, wouldn't last long at all, mate. You, you've got you've got to go there knowing you know you've got to believe in yourself. You've got you've got you've got to have that yeah. belief and and know that you can beat them players because on your day, you can shoot four sixty sixes and and compete. You know, it's it, it just is. I suppose in, in a way, I might be wrong in saying this, but I feel like everyone that's on the European tour, like you said, has the ability to win an event because right. even to get on the tour, you've got to be so good that you've yeah. got four six six in your locker. Yeah, yeah. And if you do that in four days, you're probably going to win an event. But one of the questions I jump in a little bit ahead to Friday then was, how different is it? You've missed the cut Friday. You're obviously a bit upset, whatever, naturally. You know, you go out to the hotel compared to you've made the cut. Like how did do you, it sounds silly? Do you get like a different meal? Do you treat yourself to a steak? Well, Does it feel different? Depends obviously. where you are in the world as well. I mean, if you're in Europe, you're getting on a flight and you're getting home as quick as possible to your to your family. Yeah. Uh, and and, and how easy is that? How easy is literally just you know, you know, when do you book your flight home? Well, like when you get there, do you have a flight plan to get home on a Friday? I'm are you checking very, times or I'm very lucky because I married an aerostess. Okay. So <laughs> my part of the master plan wasn't yeah. it? Was well, that's why I married her. I hope yeah. she don't listen to this. So. Um, um, no, I'm so so. I can Friday night if we if we have a bad Thursday, I will just say to her, say, look, keep an eye out for the flight for Friday. <laughs> Get a plane ready. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll come off the course, and she'll say, I'll book you on the six o'clock. Oh, really? Yeah. She already know, knows. Know. Do you text yeah. her halfway round? No, no. I've got another question. I don't know if you'll answer this or not. Obviously, have you ever been in a situ- situation where it's Friday? And you're close to making the cut, but you just know that you're miles and miles off the lead. Yeah. Is there any situation where you'd almost rather just miss the cut and get home no. than make the cut and just know you're going to come bottom? If, if you look cut? at the stats for the amount of people that have done well, top 10 finishes, from making the cut on the mark so then to, to, to then finishing top 10 is unbelievable. Really? They, they call Saturday moving day. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and there's no... You don't normally stay the same position on a Saturday. You either go down south or you, you move up the leaderboard. The, the players play more aggressive on Saturday. Is that why? Because they've made the cut. I mean, it it's depends, like they're going to get paid. It depends what position you're in. You know, if, you're, if you've just made the cut on the mark, there's nothing to lose. You're going out there to, to shoot to, as low as you can. Up. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Uh, where am I ne- up to next? So I've done f- Thursday, Friday. We can skip through. We've made the cut. Now you've missed it by five. Oh, yeah. Crap. <laughs> I'm not on the plane home. Now no, you've got to pack it, the bag yourself. And take gonna, it home. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Does yeah. the player then pack the bag and no, take I, it home? I pack the bag, um, put everything in there, and then it's just up for the up to the player then to get the bag and take it to the airport. Does it ever go overweight? Yes. All the time. A lot of times, yeah. Because I feel like mine would always be overweight. Yeah. How many clubs do players typically take to a tournament with them? 17, 18 yeah. average. I'd be like 20 odd. But then don't, I always f- remember the don't forget, this is, this is something that a lot of people don't know, but every week, player gets four dozen balls, six gloves, four hats, two towels, every week. Now, if you miss the cut, you've only used a dozen and a half, two dozen. That's an extra few Ks in the, in the luggage. So have you got a lot of golf balls then at home? No, I mean... I, I <laughs> It depends what play you, you 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 know you're cutting for whether he keeps them or whether you let you let you have a dozen or so. How many holes does a player typically use a ball for? Um, it, that and can it vary? Yeah, that does vary because it you know if you're going well and the ball's fine, there's no scuff on it, then they'll tend to keep using it. Um, if they make a bogey, normally the, you know there's a little bit of a scuff after a wedge shot, then they'll change it. But um, I mean, for example, Dave probably uses. Four or five around, I would say, roughly. You know, we've got something in common. What's that? I once caddied for David Howell. Did you? Fact. Where at? <laughs> Mia. Right. When I used to be an, I was an assistant pro. There was a golf day going on, an ISM golf day when he was connected with ISM. So you had Darren Clark, Westwood, David Howell, and I got responsibility for caddying for David Howell. Right, brilliant. There was three temporary greens out on the golf course at the time, and he played pretty well. Did he take the mick out of you? can't remember. He's very good. Howler's, He's quite dry, if yeah, I remember. Howler's one of the best to have as your pro-am player. Right. Because he really 
you know, for five, six hours, whatever we are on the golf course, we'll really, really try and make you feel like you've had a good day. You know, he's, he's that kind of person. I've got a couple of quick ones. I've got right? a good one as well. I've got some really good <laughs> well, ones. Well, I've got some good ones as well. <laughs> I feel like, sorry, we're 55 minutes in, and I honestly thought this would be 30 minutes, but I just want to keep asking questions. Yeah. Just keep going. Um, question. Yep. And again, you might not want to answer this. What's it like being sacked by a player? Uh, I've only ever been sacked once. Okay. Um, every other one has been a mutual thing uh, normally, but I think, do you know what? You get a bit... You, you know when it's coming. You know... Um, is, it, is it just the personal relationship falls down a bit as well? Like, did he not talk to you? Y- yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends. I feel like I'd if, go through if, Caddis quick. If you're going... Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of players on tour that do. I feel uh, like I would. I yeah. feel like... Yeah, I can't blame myself. I can't blame my clubs. Yeah, you got... You, they, the and that's what, and that's what we are. We're the, we're the next your phone's going to fall your pocket any second, we're, Steve. We're the next person um, and to you, so we are the one that gets it in the neck. And that's why... As a caddy, you've got to be pretty thick-skinned. You'll be able to take it. Um, there's only so much you can take. And, you know, if you're, if you're a decent caddy, I think that you you don't let it out on the golf course, but as soon as you come off the golf course, you pull your player to one side. You do and say, say, talk right. to me like that again, yeah. I'll lamp you. Yeah. <laughs> Is that like... Cause there's Not been, so much lamp you, but... There's been times uh, yeah. where player... I, I, can't remember, I can't quite remember who it was recently who's been really quite nasty to the caddy. Yeah. Do you know who it was? Yes. Are you allowed to say? No. I think it was televised. I can't quite remember it, it was, was now. Yeah. Um, well, like, what happens then? Like, what, you know, the caddies, let's say you all meet at night. Well, is, he, is he fuming? Yeah, is he like, if he talks to me like that again, I'm going to absolutely... Again, it depends. Who, tell him off. <laughs> it depends who you are as a caddy. Now, this caddy, if, if, we, if we're talking about the same person... It was recent. It was quite well documented. That oh, it, that you're talking about Jordan Spieth when he was shouting um, to Mike about uh, oh, yeah. going over the green or... That, it, yeah, that was one, but I feel like that's that's not the one possibly I'm thinking of because I feel like that's quite high profile and yeah. I kind of I kind of get that. Was it was it not one where there was like a caddy like a play like threw a head cover at a caddy or they threw something at the caddy? Well What's your story? Not telling you. Um, I've got <laughs> two quick ones there. Well, one quick one. Who, obviously, some of the players that you've carried for, all the players that you mentioned before are, you know, well-known names, yep. big, big names in the European Tour. Mm-hmm. Who is the biggest name you've ever been in a three-ball with? Um, well, we've been out with Rory. Um, that's, you can't get much bigger, can you, really? No, that's... Uh, that, I Other mean, than Tiger, Tiger yeah. It? And you've yeah. seen Tiger hobbling across the yeah. point green. Yeah, Um I mean, you always... Whenever you play with... Unless they're having a really off week, there's a chance that you might play with them. But you've got to be on top of your game to be out with those kind of players. So because you're not going to for the players, you know, it, it, obviously the the way that they put players together on the Thursday Friday is often headline. Yeah, names. they're TV groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so like I say, it, it just happens to be coincidence if you get out with them at the moment. Yes. The players well, you've I mean, with. like I said, that you know, unless you're top of your game or they're not having a great week, that's when you've got a chance of playing with the top players. Yeah. And then, just, sorry, just just one more kind of on that is if I got my European Tour card tomorrow and I ended up ended up in a in a game with with Rory. Yep. Although obviously I'm focusing on my own game, I'm also massively going to look at them for inspiration. Yeah, does that happen for you as a caddy? Do you have? I know you've done this for years, but do you ever play? Is that like right Billy term? Foster? Yeah, yeah. Do you look at these other guys and think I'm going to just keep keeping on what they do and maybe well, learn yeah, some I mean, more tricks. You always, tips. yeah. I mean, you're always thriving to do better. Um, you know, and if you can do a good job in that three ball in that situation when a, a really good player is in there you try and do your best so you can get noticed if you like mm. so you know the only way you're going to move up the rankings is if big players like that see you and when they when it comes around um that they want to change the caddy they might might keep you in mind i was going to say when there's rumbles of a big player mm. getting rid of the caddies yeah everyone i was going to say how do you put yeah. but how, how do, do you, you put yourself yeah. managers normally yeah, you just you just email the manager or call the manager and say, look, you know, what if your player here is though. Um, Do they well, not it's like applying for another job. Yeah, yeah I mean, no, I, I think you obviously don't play. You obviously don't tell your player that you're going to go for another job. But I think if he ever found out, I think unless he was on par with that person, or it was or, going down, or, or, or yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think they could really argue the case because if you're going for, you know, if you're if you're finishing. 70th in the order of merit most, most years and then you're going for a top 50 in the world bag yeah, don't really think they've got that a, makes sense a nice um, have you carried the majors yes 
Which ones? Uh, the Open, uh, the US Open, and the US PGA. Not the Masters yet. I'm guessing that's on the list. That, as a caddy, there's two things you want to strive to do, and that's play the Masters, wear the boiler suit, and do the Ryder Cup. Ones that have eluded you so far, but yes. there's time. Yes. I, um, I spoke to, t- talking about Billy Foster, I um, I spoke to Billy Foster, um, I am do- just started doing a podcast a little bit like this. For Sorry, just a quick one, uh, uh, Greenkeeper's just nipping past, but he's doing a great job. Yeah, it's fine. What? That's it. He wants to, uh, oh, he's, oh, he's coming, the plants. coming the plants. Get this on video here, yeah. Harry. Look at this. Look at this. Great service. Thanks you, so you much. You just missed one there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. We're going through a dry patch here in the UK at the moment. Yeah. So going back to Billy, I did a podcast with him. So I've started interviewing the caddies. Well, this, is, this is your plug now. This is my plug, yeah. I listened so to the first five minutes of the Wee Man one that you've yep. posted. Yeah, so the Wee Man's done two weeks. We've had... Who's um, Martin Keimer's caddy. Yes, we've had 380-odd listens on that in the first week. Um, Dominic Bott has been released yesterday. Uh, who caddied for Torbjorn Olsen, Thomas Bjorn... Um, Big name, played Ryder Cup, won multiple times. Um, and I've got, I've just, I, I recorded Billy um, just a couple of days ago. And I was, and Billy's had 42 wins in his caddy and career. Wow. Well, Seve and every, like, yeah. caddy for Seve. And, and when Westwood. you listen to the Billy one, it's a really, really good listen. He's got so many stories. And oh, we should have got him on the podcast. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Cheers, lads. <laughs> right, anyway. Um, and and I, uh, one of the questions I asked Billy was, out of your 42 wins would you ever give it up for a major? Because he's never won a major. And he said he would give them all up to win the British Open. Wow. That is interesting because we had a topic, I think, was this on the podcast? Or just, I think it was. Oh, I can't remember. But we were on about Poulter. And if I said I believe he'd swap all his Ryder Cups for a major. Yeah. And was it with John Robbins? I can't remember. I think it was one before we started re- actual video pa- recording. Possibly, it. yeah. Yeah, Billy said that his Ryder Cups were more, more of a buzz than... An individual win as well. Do they get paid for that? For the Ryder Cup? I think they get a little bit of a wage, yeah, but nothing... Do, do the hotels and everything get sorted yeah, that week? Yeah, yeah, your flight so accommodation, yeah. yeah you, you don't pay for anything. Do, do, they get, do you get looked after better for majors? Um, or yeah. just have to look after yeah, in, yourself? in a way. Um, I mean, Because everyone in the Open gets paid, right? Yes. So yeah. you're, you're guaranteed to make money in the Open Yes. as a caddy? Yes, but not a lot. I mean, if you, yeah, if, I, if, I you, think if, like you do, if you miss a cut, you're probably making three or four hundred quid. Yeah, it's nothing. I've, I saw that. We had a friend who qualified at, <clears throat> at Carnoustie a couple of years ago and he, he, he didn't make the cut and that was the only reason I realised they got paid I think yeah, they I'm might, might sure it's like get two and a half grand or something I thought he got paid a few grand yeah, yeah. something like that I think um, that's interesting yeah. so how you know how obviously you're on a bag at the moment tough times with everything we've mentioned as before yeah. Yeah. like what's the goal for you do you want to take a player to someone like you got now and get them to a level. Do you want to try and pick up a young gun yeah, who I has think, promise? I think. Um, I, I think know the it's way hard to say now because you're still on a bag. Well, but no, I'm just not intrigued. really. I, I think you know, Dave. Dave um, is is a pretty level-headed guy, and he knows how, how the job works. And he's been out there long enough. He's, you know, he's done it. He's won four times on the European Tour, so he's a good player. Um, but I think all these young kids that are coming through, like for example, the Hogard brothers that have just come through, they're twins on tour, first rookie year. And I'm watching them on the range um, in Doha uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the, it's just immense. And have they got caddies already? Yeah. How yeah. does that happen? Well, they come from Challenge Tour, really. So, so um, cad- they've been caddying from for a so while. Ma- yeah, I mean, the two the two guys that they've got now have, didn't come through Challenge Tour. No, they were just um, employed when they got the European Tour card. Um, and again, probably uh, went through managers. The many Challenge Tour caddies get... I don't know, let go as a player moves on to European Tour to get a, like a European Tour caddy or do a lot of caddies from the Challenge Tour then come into the European Tour? Yeah, I mean, if you've been with a, a player all through Challenge Tour and you've got his card through the Challenge Tour onto the European you'd Tour... You'd be a bit annoyed if you got sacked off. Oh, that, massively, you? massively. You you would be fuming, yeah. Because that's... that's it makes sense. As a caddy, that's your, your sort of starting block If as a new caddy, really. I have so many emails from punters saying oh, I really want to become a professional golf caddy can you give me some idea on how to do it and and I, I have to be pretty blunt with them and say look there's more caddies than there is players mm. there's caddies that have been out there 30 odd years that can't get a job at the minute so for you coming through with no experience you've got no chance I think as well just on that it's like as a caddy like you said before you are an 
integral part of the team. Mm. So it's like say, I'm, I'm sure it has happened before, but just because you've got for the challenge to onto European tour, you wouldn't necessarily sack off your coach, would you? Yeah, it has swap. been done before though. Yeah, you're right. Well, it has been, but like yeah. you, in theory, you wouldn't want to swap your club straight away I, I think, or sack I think off your players, coach. I think. Uh, they, they think feel like because you're moving up a league you've got to change everything yeah, I think, Tommy was quite open that's, with that Tommy I think it's a big influence said. with the managers as well I think because the managers have been around the tour for such a long time and then they get a new kid on the block his first rookie and they year, say no you can't be coached by him because you can't got have no him credibility. for you yeah. 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 So they and, have and, a bit too much there's, influence there's, there's a bit of influence from the manager on that side Yeah, I think I'd be reluctant as a player though if I trust a team that I've got in place and then you go well, well, just because you're on this tour now you have to sack all your team off it well again be. that's what Tommy said Tommy you know had good success when he first got on tour then didn't sacked everyone off his yeah. coach started his caddy again. everything started again to thinking because that was what he needed to do had this perception he needed to change mm-hmm. everything Realised that was completely the wrong way to go, and yeah. went back to Old complete school. everything again. Yeah. Gone yeah. back to you know yeah. his coach Tomo, his caddy Finno fin- yeah. on the bag. Um, we've got some questions. I'm going to fire through them got quickly. It. It's getting a bit breezy here, right? Now. It's getting yeah, cold, it's getting isn't cold. it? Weirdly. And then we're going to go and play some golf where Steve's going to caddy for me. Yeah, I'm excited. Can't wait. I didn't realise you were a plus three handicap. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was uh, I was here at twenty past seven this morning plotting my way round. So I've got uh, a game plan for you. Well, nice. I, I said I'd be here at ten. I rolled up at five two. Yeah. And then we decided to do the podcast instead of going playing golf. And that's getting cold. Um, on the podcast each week, yeah, we do a nightmare story. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have got loads of emails, but I thought with you playing with so many golfers yep. and playing in so many golfers with pro-ams and stuff, can you share with us a nightmare story? Um, as in, from me, on a caddy point matter. of view? No, if, okay. Either a caddy, let's say you're on a play and they've hit the worst, terrible opening tee shot you've ever seen, or whether it was actually something that happened in a pro-am, or whether it was something you saw with another caddy. Give, like, has a caddy ever turned up 20 minutes late and running down oh, the caddies run, have missed tea time like, yeah. give us a nightmare story it's okay. normally nightmare first tea stories okay I'll um, I'll give you a, a, just a, a name cu- names I'll give you a couple <laughs> one about me and one about Howler okay so we are um, either it's, it's one one or two shots behind going into the Saturday of the Dunhill Links the year that uh, Howler won in 2013 and uh, we're on the first tee Wind slightly helping, and we're talking about what club to hit off the tee. And um, and I said, look, there's front front right flag, downwind. We need to be hitting a fuller shot in. You don't want to be chipping something over the over the burn there. Right, okay. So what do you think? Then? I said, well, it's just three iron. So let's get it down there, two forty down the fairway. Leave yourself a wedge on. Now, the road that runs across um, the eighteenth and the first fairway is about one hundred and twenty yards off the tee. How the fats this three iron? And it literally just rolls over the road. And it's like, well, I haven't got a yardage from there. And there's a lot of people about. And it's, it's packed. You know, it's, it's St. Andrews, you know, there's loads. What was his reaction like? <laughs> he, he's quite, like you said, he's quite dry. He just comes over. He says, I didn't quite get that. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's sort of, you know, light the, the mood the situation. Bit, yeah. yeah. So we get down there and then I've got him a yard in. It's like 200 and two yards to carry the burn and 207 to the flag so we're out into it three iron second shot into into 18 in, went no, the ga- into the first oh into the first sorry yeah which is which is pretty similar over the little yeah, burn over now. the burn yeah so we've got got it in a mind that look let's just hit it to the back edge of the green and try and two put and he made an unbelievable four out of it that's crazy but then so the same same tournament in on the sunday we're playing 18 and we're tied for the lead so last hole of the tournament tied for the lead and we're talking about the same kind of thing. It's just over the... Just a quick one. Do you think that fat three iron off the first hole eased the mood to have him have a fantastic Saturday and get into the lead? I I think, no. What did help was we played with Hugh Grant for quite a few years and, and he's good friends with Hugh. And Hugh's very light-hearted, quite um, funny. And I think that helped... Ease him. Ease him a little bit, yeah. Because, nice. you know, in between the golf, he was talking to you about... Yeah, telling things, jokes so. and whatever. Yeah, so that that was good. But on the su- on the Sunday, we are tied for the lead, playing 18. Now, Howler doesn't look at, at leaderboards, so it's all up to me to tell him what to do. And is that true? I sometimes find that hard yeah, to believe that players weird, don't it? look at well, leaderboards. That, it's the last leaderboard at the Dunhill Links is on the 14th, so 15, 16, 17, he wouldn't know what's going on anyway. So I'm looking up the left of eight of the first, which is the 18th, to see where we are. So we can see that we are tied for the lead. So, But Howler hasn't looked at this. So the the 
pin position is four yards over the, the valley of sin. So if you don't quite get it, it's coming all the way back down and it's a horrible two put from there. I don't know if you meant, this is at St Andrews. This is at St everyone, Andrews, everyone sorry. Yeah, St Andrews, yeah. At Dunhill Links, you play yeah. it over three courses, don't you? But the yeah. final round's at St Andrews. St Andrews, yeah. So um, he says to me, so what do you think off the tee? So I said, well, you know, again, we need to leave ourselves a full shot in. We don't want to be chipping it over there with no green to play with. Let's hit three wood off the tee. Um, should leave us about 120 yards. Should be a full wedge. Right, so we both agreed with that. And he hit it didn't quite get it and lands on the road Uh oh so now and i've and he reminds me of this i've slapped my thigh and god god you know because you don't get a drop off the road the road's part of the golf course so it stayed on the road stayed on the road oh right i thought you meant it like pitched on it <laughs> no okay no, it's so rolled it's, onto it's the on road the road and stayed on the road this so is the final round final round we've last got, hole yeah we're You're tied leading. for the tied for the lead right and we need to make four and then hope Peter you line behind don't birdie the last or birdie it to to win the tournament or win the playoff. So we get up there and we're sitting on concrete like this, um, and it's well tarmac and it's it's like Jesus Christ, you know, how are you going to play this? Yeah, you know, yeah. how many how many times you've practiced yeah, off, exactly. off, off the road? So we talk about it, and there was a a lady in the crowd wearing a big pink pink jacket, uh, stood out like a sore thumb, and I I said to him, I said, look, let's just chip and run an eight iron up the right hand side forget the flag forget going up and down the valley of sin uh let's hit an eight iron up there let's try and make a four and he said to me is four good enough i said four's good enough let's just make a four and i was then thinking if pete bird is the last then we, yeah, we yeah. finish second yeah. but you know off a road to a tight flag there's no way in the world yeah. you could have took it on so that's what he tried to do and he played an unbelievable shot got all the way up to the valley of sin come all the way back down Uh oh. and then now I'm thinking well he's going to bogey this there's no way I mean as good a putter as the guy is no way he can two put from there it's, just it's such a difficult two put and he puts it up to six inches and taps it in for nice. a four and then we win the win in the playoff fantastic so yeah it's, uh, that is a good story enjoyed that yeah they're good really good I bet you've got a, a million stories and yeah. like I say I'm conscious of time because we need to go and play some golf super quick questions from yep. people listening right <laughs> are you ready yeah uh, what's the most S-H-I-T you've ever gotten from a pro? Um, I, I'm I'm pretty lucky that I haven't wi- I haven't been in, in, in a, a relationship, if you like, with a player where he's given me too much rubbish. That's fine. I think I think I I sort of w- when I'm first coming out on t- uh, with the, in the relationship, I just make sure that they don't give me any of that. How much do you talk with the player? All the time. Yeah, non-stop about rubbish. Re- just to take yeah, his mind just off to take it. his mind off golf. Part what, of the caddy's job, that. What do you do if... I don't know what this random question. What do you do if you and the pl- you and the player both need to use the bathroom? Um, well, it depends what we're going for, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's normally in the port and I'm around the back. Um, how how heavy is the bag once it's packed? Around 20Ks. Okay. Um, duh, duh, duh. What are the top three unwritten rules of being a caddy? Uh, unwritten rules. Keep up, shut up... Um, be on time. I like that. Yeah, I think don't be late is a big one. And make sure, do you have to count the clubs? Always. <laughs> um, do you wish you could use a trolley? There was a survey done a couple of years ago about power caddy uh, being a power power caddy tournament, and I was the only caddy that voted for a power caddy, apparently. Is that um, right? Yeah, apparently all the others said, said no, no, it's so easy to carry a bag across the green. And yeah, that does actually make sense. Go around. But yeah, so when I thought about it after, I thought, yeah, actually, it's probably right. Do you always wear trainers? Yes. You have to? Yes. You're not allowed to wear spikes, are you? No. I didn't but know you, that you wouldn't want 300 uh, people no, know, on, yeah. on the greens with spikes. Um, do, 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 how, do you, how do you calculate distances? Through my yardage book. Are you good at maths? I wasn't, but I am now. <laughs> I feel like I, I, that would be something I'd be terrible at. I think it's like darts, though, and that you start to just... It's still terrible now. I you think, are, I think when, you've, <laughs> when you've done it for such a long time, it just comes natural now. Have you ever got any really bad calculations? Yes. Have you? Yes. Did you ever admit to it? Yes, oh, right. you have to, especially when the crowd are looking like that over the back <laughs> of the green and it's gone into the trees. Oh, my God. I could tell you a quick story about that if you Go like. for it. So uh, 16th at uh, Munich, caddying for Steve Webster, and the, f- the green sort of goes from left to right and it's over water. Now, what they do on the pin sheet is they give you a TL and a TR. So the TL is to the left edge of the green and the TR is to the right of the green. So from the numbers, you'll have a black number and a red number. The red number's to TL, the black number's to TR. Uh, to TR. So I've stood on the, on the fairway, only 120 yards. I've given him the TL number, but the TR flag. Oh. So it's 15 yards out, 
too far. So we've we've picked nine iron, and we've is hit the shot, and it's right down the banner, and we've both gone, oh come on, be good, be good. And I'll never forget because we're doing all right, so we've got quite a few people around us. I'll never forget the crowd just looking over their heads and then putting their hands on their head as it clatters round into the trees behind. And he's and I've gone, did you thin that? And he went, no. And I went, oh no. I said that's my bad. Oh my god. And he went, he went, what do you mean? I said I've just give you the wrong wrong note. And how did he deal with that? Well, I think unless you try and sugarcoat it as a caddy and try and blame something else. They've got no comeback because as long as you're honest with it, yeah. you know, you didn't mean to do it. But I said, Webb, I said, I've made such a bad mistake there. I'm 15 yards out. Call me a few names. It's probably it okay to do it once. If, if that yeah. was every hole, I don't think you'd have a job for no, one, would you? It's not very often you do it, especially now when we both have yardage books. Back in those days, it was just the caddy had the yardage book. So. Are there players on tour you wouldn't caddy for? Yes. <laughs> Can't tell you. How high up the ranking would they need to be for you to caddy for them? Uh, that's a good question. That's, that's one I've I just st- made I up. still don't think I would. If it, you had a top 10 player, yep, no. approacher... Th- that this, the person that I've got in my mind, he, he could be world number one and I couldn't caddy for him. Oh, my God. Who does is. caddy for him? Huh? It, like, obviously, it, someone caddies for him. You doesn't. can't say who. Do they, do they like caddy for him? No. Does anyone... Nobody likes him? Has he been through He's, a lot of pla- he, caddies? He goes through a lot of caddies, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> do Does he typically get a... Like a new caddy out on tour? Um, no, no. Someone will caddy for him because they need a job, but mm. um, I just don't think I could do it. Couldn't, couldn't, an- couldn't, couldn't handle, if you couldn't couldn't handle get the on, If you couldn't get on a bag for a year yep. and he was world number one? I'd sooner stack shelves in Aldi. This is going to go on forever now. So, right, so <laughs> you've not had a job for five years. He's world number one. He's won four majors in a row. Would you caddy for him? No. <laughs> How long are we now, Rick? How long have we been talking sorry. for? On 16. We're nearly right. done. Um... It's just some really good ones. Uh, who's the funniest character on tour? Funniest character on tour? Jamie Donaldson. Nice. Uh, da, 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 right, last one then. <laughs> Have you got anything to add? What, about Jamie Donaldson? Oh, me yeah. or you who? or whoever. Only thing I was going to say, if you've listened this far, we appreciate it. Make sure you rate the podcast five stars. And Steve, what's your podcast called so people can find uh, it? So Life in the Loop. Life in the Loop. Yeah, if you, it? it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Wherever um, you get your podcast from. Wherever you get your podcast from, it's on there. Um, Great. I've got um, a good question. Life in the Loop, yeah. Is there ever a player, is the one standout player you would dream to caddy for? Uh, outside of Tiger or... Let's so go tiger. outside of Tiger. Go on then. Rank the top five. Ooh, tiger. Nice. Okay. Rory. Um, Past or present, doesn't matter. I, would, I wouldn't have minded working for Monty back in the day, you know? Even though... He's earned uh, some money. Yeah, he, I think he's been... Uh, he was quite hard work, but, you know, I actually quite got on well with Monty, so I wouldn't have minded that. Westwood I wouldn't mind working for. I think he's, a you know, a decent guy. Um, I'd love to carry for Poulter in the Ryder Cup. Mm. Yeah, that'd be fun. There was an interview with Poulter once. If there was a world ranking for match play, where would you rank? And he said zero. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite funny. Last one. This is one that I made up. Okay, you've got the choice of caddying for a player. Yeah. Okay. To win the Masters. Right? Yeah. So the caddy wins the Masters, right? Yeah. Or would you prefer to have been caddying for a player who wins the biggest prize fund that's ever happened in golf? Masters all day long. So you would you'd sacrifice the extra cut that you would get. The more the, the money that you would make off the back of winning the Masters is with free flights and hotels. Okay, for okay. Oh, for the let year. me change it. <laughs> Chance to caddy for a player to win the Masters, but you make no money. <laughs> or a normal event where the pri- where the prize for first place is five million. That's going to make me half a million quid. So obviously I'm going to say half a million quid. Okay. <laughs> what Rick likes to do he likes to change the question so you answer the one that he wants you to answer. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, as I much as so right, you can answer. win the Masters, but you have to get your hands chopped off. Yeah. Or <laughs> you can win another event and win ten million pounds. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a silly question, that really. But the, yeah. Mas- the Masters would be, uh, yeah, well, Br- Br- British Open for me would be the biggest major. Well, let, let's say you asked it to Poulter. Let's, <laughs> uh, you're probably not the answer, but if you gave Poulter the option to win the British Masters with no money, not British Masters. <laughs> <laughs> I think British Rick's Open. got sunstroke now, Steve. 
British Open. <laughs> Not sad win, for quite a while. You can win the Open and win no money or win <laughs> one event for 10 million, a random event. It's uh, probably hard for a player. You can't answer for Paul. He's, he's a right. I think he on that note, no. <laughs> Rick's question Guys. time comes to an end. <laughs> you know, all those questions, none of them were from social media. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. Guys, thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Uh, we're going to go out and film a little video now with Steve where he's going to caddy me around the golf course. We're going to see if we can break par. The sun is out. It's not as windy. He's been prepared for three hours here already. We've just done a one hour, 20 minute podcast, which was supposed to be only 30 minutes. Hopefully it's taking your mind off what's happening in the world at the moment. Make sure you like and rate this podcast, share it around. I feel like we could probably do another five podcasts with Steve and maybe we should do another one in the future. Look forward to it, mate. Hopefully Thanks you get back up on running again on the golf bag soon. Fingers and if crossed. not, you can come and caddy for me full time. Absolutely. You pay the wages, mate. I'll be here. Or you could win the Masters with no money. Yeah. Choose. <laughs> Let's get a minute first. <laughs>